Good afternoon, everybody. A uh, uh, very warm welcome on behalf of uh, Lorena Hernandez, uh, Project Officer at the Joint Research Center of uh, European Commission, and myself, uh, Simon Vrechar, Consultant at uh, Joint Research Center as well of European Commission, uh, who together will be today co-hosting co this webinar uh, with the title Location Intelligence for Cities and Regions, Preparing the Ground for Smart Places of the Future. Um, being also the part of the so-called Location Intelligence for Cities and Regions event pack, about uh, which we will discuss a bit later. Uh, so, uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll introduce a bit ELISA for those who don't know. So, ELISA stands for European Location Interoperability, Interoperability Solutions for e-Government. And uh, as an action, is a part of the ISA Square program. Uh, which is a European interoperability program uh, aiming uh, at providing cross-border and uh, cross-sector interoperability solution for public administrations as well for the uh, businesses and citizens. So this program is consisting of uh, 40, 54 different actions tackling interoperability from different angles where ELISA is uh, actually the only actions among them focusing on the location dimension uh, of uh, 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 as a driver of enabling the digital government uh, uh, transformation. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, a bit the LISA knowledge transfer activities uh, uh, in frame of which uh, we are organizing periodically webinars whose aim is to engage in an, an agile way with topics of relevance uh, to the digital transformation uh, by uh, harnessing the use of location data and technologies. So more information on those webinars organized so far together uh, with uh, the, uh, the presentations and recordings can be found on the Lise uh, join, join up page. So as uh, on the next slide, as uh, mentioned already at the beginning, uh, we'll have a few words about the Location Intelligence for Regions and Cities event pack. Uh, we see local and regional uh, governments and other subnational governments play, uh, play a very important role, not only in implementing uh, cohesion policy through different instruments of uh, uh, European Union. Uh, in the frame of European structural investment funds, we have European Regional Development Fund, Social Fund and Cohesion Fund. Uh, but also to deliver efficient services uh, to businesses and citizens, uh, supporting uh, them in different uh, life events. So in these processes, uh, interoperable location data and services underpinned by location intelligence play a very important role. Therefore, uh, on the LISA action, we are preparing a series of, of events uh, uh, that, is, uh, um, that are dedicated to location intelligence supporting cities and regions. Uh, starting today with this webinar, where uh, we would like to present the state of the art and the future perspective uh, uh, on the use uh, of uh, location data and technologies by local and regional governments and uh, their, uh, their role um, towards um, the so-called smart transformation. Uh, we'll continue on 17th September at two o'clock again. Uh, so we continue the story by sharing the insights to key concepts and definitions uh, relating to location intelligence, um, uh, GOI, digital twins of government, and trying to explain the trends in digital government technology that shape location intelligence with uh, additional view on their um, uh, transformational uh, potential and their mat maturity timeline uh, supported by several case studies and uh, we will have a special guests uh, from cities of uh, Helsinki and Guimaraes. Uh, and uh, we'll conclude on 14th of October at 11.30 uh, during the 18th European uh, Week of Regions and Cities uh, with a so-called participatory lab on uh, location intelligence for cities and regions in which uh, we'll showcase uh, opportunities uh, that the use of location intelligence can offer uh, to uh, regional and city administrations and we will show this through uh, to, to, through two different stories one on the use of uh, location intelligence intelligence in energy efficiency uh, 
another one on the data ecosystems. So to take part uh, on all these events, uh, please uh, visit Eli uh, Elisa Action join up page and register for all the events. Uh, so coming back to today uh, on the next slide. Uh, so today we had uh, with us uh, two uh, speakers, uh, both senior researchers from KU Leuven, uh, Glenn Wakuvenberg and Therese Stenbergen who together with um, GRC, Elise Action Team, have carried uh, out the research uh, for this webinar. So uh, what uh, we are going to uh, discuss, so what we will cover today, it's our foreseen five sections. In first one, uh, we'll put the context and the broader definition of smart places and their policy and technical context. Uh, in the continuation, we will narrowing to the local and regional governments and the provision of services, and then how location intelligence can support uh, uh, these uh, smarter local and regional public uh, services. In, in, in chapter, in section four, uh, we'll go through uh, uh, some, some cases uh, that are uh, showcasing the support uh, of transformation by location intelligence. And in the concluding uh, section, uh, we discuss a bit about the strategies and actions that are shifting towards the smart place, the places. Uh, last but not least to mention that the question and answering part uh, will come at the end of the webinar, where your comments and ideas will be very much appreciated. So before the start and giving floor to the first speaker, uh, Glenn, uh, we'll start uh, with the first poll. So we are, uh, we will have a few polls uh, today. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, we will, uh, so I suppose you can see the poll already at, on your screen. So we would ask you to uh, answer the question about your affiliation. So where are you coming from? And uh, how familiar are you with the concept of the location intelligence? So we'll give you maybe uh, 20 seconds to, give your answers here. Okay, another five seconds. Okay, so we conclude the polling, so sharing the results. Uh, so we'll see that today, uh, oh, the, the, the majority are coming from the private sector, uh, large enterprises, and then from the national public administration. And the uh, majority of you know the basics, the basic concepts of the uh, uh, location intelligence. Uh, and uh, a lot of you as well, very well. So I think these are the good inputs uh, for Glenn to start. So please, Glenn. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Simon, for this introduction. Uh, also, thank you for the invitation for us to prepare uh, this uh, webinar, this presentation on the topic of location intelligence for smarter uh, sub-national governments. Uh, I must admit, I, I fully support this idea for uh, the ELISA uh, action to really spend more attention to better recognize how also sub-national uh, governments, uh, municipal cities and other subnational governments uh, could be uh, better engaged, better involved in, in many of the very interesting uh, activities Elise has been developing or is still developing. Because I think of much of what has been what has been done and what is currently being prepared under the action is, is really relevant for uh, this target group. But so far, we didn't uh, look uh, much into them. So I think uh, this presentation, this webinar, but also the two other actions you mentioned, I think it's, it's quite relevant, quite important. Uh, now, just to briefly introduce myself, I I'm not a smart city expert. I have a background in public administration, public administration research. But to be honest, also a lot of our research really or strongly focused on, on rather the national European level. Uh, we sometimes did a few studies on looking at also how, what municipalities, what the regions have been doing, but also from the research side, that is, that is something that we uh, didn't fully uh, or didn't fully take into consideration. So I think this webinar for us was also a good opportunity to really look at what already exists, what are the key elements we need to take into account. 
but I'm also looking forward to the input from the other participants on what they consider to be relevant, what they consider to be uh, challenges. Now, as the introduction, we start with the concept of smart places. Uh, and we would like to also say a few words on the technical and policy context related to this, and especially related to uh, smart places at the subnational level. Uh, what we did here, we showed in fact two different views on, on the issue of smart places. On the left one, we adopted the common EC definition of smart cities, but we extended it uh, just as an introduction to also include municipalities, cities and regions, uh, and what they should do to become smart places uh, is they have to use or they should use digital and telecommunication technologies uh, to support, improve, but also transform uh, their traditional networks and services, uh, all with the, uh, in the benefit of their citizens and their businesses. So it's about using uh, ICT for supporting uh, many different decisions, but also service delivery in many different domains, but also to better engage uh, their citizens and to work more closely together with them. So this is the, IC, the EC view. And then on the right side, I really like uh, this picture from uh, Libellium, so more from the private uh, sector, which shows in fact many different applications uh, uh, in the context of a smart world. So how can we make our world smarter? Uh, I'm not going to uh, explain all the details. I think what's important here when you look at each of these uh, elements of smartness, each of these uh, applications is, that quite a lot of them, or in, in fact, uh, most of them are closely related to the activities of local governments, regional governments, et cetera, which shows that uh, in order to turn our world into a smarter world, we really need to uh, focus or really, really need to engage those uh, subnational governments. Now, it's not only about subnational government, it's also at a lower level. You have smart buildings, you have smart, uh, yeah, many other th uh, things of smart uh, streets, smart places, uh, smart uh, neighborhoods. You can also put it at the lower level and then also at the end of smart nations or even the smarter uh, Europe. So like what just to explain, you can consider that, uh, you can apply that concept of moving towards a smart world on many different levels. But we focus now today on a level we find, or a set of level we find uh, quite important. It's the local and regional level uh, where we use the overarching term of uh, subnational government. Now, if you look at the technology concept and especially the more, more recent, more innovative technological developments and trends, uh, I hear I made use of a picture of the OECD uh, when they talk about digital transformation. And when they, in which they identified a set of key technological uh, developments, key technological uh, trends, you've probably heard of most of them or many of them already before. I think also in, in the context of geospatial technologies, geospatial applications, they become more and more important. So I think they, uh, each of them, they could uh, further support the trans transition, uh, especially of the subnational governments into smart places. Uh, what we also look, if we see at current practices, is that often the cities, municipalities and regions, or at least many of them, they have a lot of experience. They can be considered as really front-running, front-runners in experimenting with these new technologies, in trying to integrate them into their uh, activities and processes to really investigate it, how each of these new technologies or, or the ecosystem of technologies uh, could help them in supporting, uh, executing their activities. So you see uh, quite in many cases, there are really the local regional levels that are working on experimentation of these. But on the other hand, we should be aware there's quite a lot of uh, variation. You also have the smaller municipalities, the less advanced municipality cities, etc. So you cannot say, or you should have be avoid uh, to focus only on those cities, those municipalities, those regions that are doing well, because there still is a quite big group of uh, yeah, subnational governments uh, for which these concepts are relatively new, new. They don't have the technological capacity, they don't have the skills, they don't have the, uh, uh, the human capacity to deal with these uh, new developments. So I think we should, uh, I think that's a key message throughout this presentation. We should be aware that when we talk about uh, subnational governments, it's really a group of a very heterogeneous group, many different types of governments, many different types of uh, organizations, 
different capacity, different experiences. So uh, very important to be aware on that. On the other side, we should also be uh, careful in only look on just looking only at the technological side. I think it's important to uh, rather consider it as an interdisciplinary or a more uh, holistic way of looking at it. How can we make sure that we combine these technologies with the necessary institutional capacity, necessary human capacity? How can we also look at the supporting process? I think also here it's important to not only look at the technology on its own, but rather uh, look at the interplay between technological and non-technological aspects. I think that's also a key message throughout this presentation. So I think we really need to make sure, see how we can make that uh, shift towards a more complete digital uh, agenda at the different levels. Now, what I did here, uh, also another key message is uh, I used a set of quotes, a set of uh, reports, recommendations, from many different actors uh, that have a key role that are at least involved looking at its support, taking decisions uh, for everything with regard to subnational governments. But just to show you or just to also inform you that the ecosystem of actors that are working on uh, in this domain, so supporting the digital transition of subnational government, it's really also heterogeneous. You can say, even say it's quite complex and also here is a challenge on how can we really better understand who is doing what and how can we involve uh, the best parties uh, to uh, realize ambition of turning these subnational governments into smart places. So this is the technology uh, view on it. Uh, like I said, I already talked about the issue of complexity uh, in terms of the ecosystem of actors. But it also strongly uh, is the case for what concerns the policies, the policy initiatives and the related policy instruments, including the legislation, but also other uh, types of uh, policy uh, instruments. I used a picture here that shows that we are really dealing with uh, an issue of multi-level governance. So at the highest level, you have the EU. They are developing some uh, overall strategies. At the lower level, you have actually the local governments that with their own policies and strategies. And then in between, you have national, you have regional, you have macro-regional strategies related policies. I think it's really important to be aware that at each of these levels, uh, there is an, a growing recognition of the need to better recognize, better involve subnational governments in the entire policy agenda on digital transformation and, and data in particular. Uh, because I believe that these uh, strategies also with regard to interoperability, uh, in reality, they only can be a success when they really uh, have a strong subnational component, when they realize what is going on uh, at that subnational level, uh, level uh, what is the current situation, what is the needs, what are the requirements uh, of these lower levels, and how can we also from the beginning involve them into the actual uh, preparation of policies into the governance. I think this still is a key challenge. Uh, you see there's a growing recognition, more and more initiatives are doing that. Uh, on the right side, I just made uh, an example, so it's not a complete list, but just a set of uh, initiatives, some from the e-government domain, some looking rather from the uh, uh, domain of urban regional policies, some uh, where there is really a need or where there's really some attention, attention has been or effort has been done to better recognize uh, these subnational components, these subnational uh, governments. I think the key message here is we really need to think on how can we really align these uh, different policy levels, but also these different types of policies. You have the more generic policies on digital government, uh, data, digital skills, etc. You have a diversity of more thematic policies. Uh, you see, especially the smart city uh, concept is coming back in, in many of these. But I think there's a really a need to, uh, uh, for alignment. On the right side, I also include a few more recent initiatives. Uh, for instance, the Digital Europe program, where you see the smart city concept, smart uh, local government concept uh, is really uh, uh, included. Also, the idea of creating a smart communities data spaces. I think each of them, and also the work of the uh, growing uh, work on of the digital innovation hubs on, on supporting sub smart cities. I think each of them are, can be considered as examples showing uh, the better uh, integration, integration of these uh, subnational components, which is really important. 
I would think uh, just as that was the introduction on what is the, considered as smart places and what is the technological policy context supporting uh, these smart places at a certain or national level. The second part of the presentation, I would uh, just say a few words on, on really better understanding what precisely local and regional governments are doing and what are the kind of uh, services uh, they are doing. Uh, because I think it's important uh, to know what are these what are these local, but not only local, but also the provincial, regional administrations. Uh, who are they? I think the number is, is quite. Uh, it says a lot. So you have more than eighty thousand local and regional governments in Europe. Uh, I think that not uh, there are quite a lot of people that are not aware of this huge size of uh, subnational governments. So it shows that you have a really important or really a uh, very big group of local governments that should be involved, should be engaged. But it also shows that, yeah, you should be aware of the heterogeneous. So it's really a challenge to make sure that you can develop, implement uh, policies uh, that are relevant uh, to each of them. Uh, also important right side, so you see you have them at least three main levels, the municipal. Uh, some countries, they also have an intermediary level. And then most countries, they also have a regional and state level. I will come back and say a few words on what each of them are uh, doing. Also in terms of more looking at the financial side, the, the public investments, the, the share of tax revenues, but also in terms of uh, employment, you should be aware that they are very important players within the European ecosystem. And there are some key reasons why uh, it's uh, in many cases the best solution to provide public services at these lowest levels of government. Uh, proximity, uh, that's a key reason, so because they are the uh, policy level the most closest to the citizen. They can easily interact. They know what their citizen is doing. Uh, that's also a reason often why they can provide certain uh, services in a more efficient way and also flexibility. So they are often smaller and they can more, again, the issue of more easily adapt to what their citizens do. This is more the public administration theory on, on why these uh, subnational governments are important. Now, like I said, I have this slide. I will not go uh, through each word of them, but just to show you what are now the domains these three uh, levels of subnational government uh, are involved in. Uh, I think it's important to be aware that if you look at them, if you compare them throughout Europe, uh, especially the municipal uh, governments, they are providing a quite similar set of uh, public services, but also that applies to the other levels. So there you see that uh, these organizations at this level, they have quite similar uh, uh, responsibilities, quite similar services they provide, uh, education, urban planning, utility networks. Those are tasks that all municipalities, uh, all uh, local governments in Europe has to uh, are involved or are responsible for. Uh, probably they, they organize it in different ways, but I think there's a, a one hand they are comparable. On the other hand, in terms of capacity, but I already mentioned him before, in terms of capacity, in terms of needs, uh, they're quite heterogeneous. And also important here is the issue of uh, the link between those different levels. The intermediary level, uh, like the provinces here in Belgium that we know, they're often involved in, in uh, supporting supra-municipal supra activities. Uh, and then you have the regional level in many countries, they're, for instance, uh, involved in the supervision of these local governments. But just to give you an idea on what are now the key, uh, the core areas of uh, or domains in which they are active, if we compare them, not on, I think this not only applies to Europe, but this compares to subnational governments or worldwide. I think it's important to just have some basic understanding on, on what precisely uh, they are doing. Uh, here, so like I said, I think you, we should be aware. So our society, we are currently confronted with quite some uh, key challenges in domains such as mobility. Also, our population becomes more diverse, becomes older. We have some particular uh, needs, new challenges with regard to housing, climate, uh, environment. I think you're all aware on that there are some uh, urgent uh, and future issues that become more and more important. I think here for tackling then, addressing then uh, local uh, subnational governments, they really have a very important role. But I, like I said before, we should also be aware on these uh, differences, heterogeneity. Uh, for instance, only looking at the local level, you have already a quite important uh, difference between more rural, more urban areas. So we should be aware on how can we uh, take into consideration these differences. 
but also municipal uh, intermediary and regional governments. In general, they're all uh, playing a key role in tackling these challenges, but on the other hand, there's also the diversity. So in this presentation, we use sometimes the overarching concept of subnational governments, while in reality, this concept refers to a variety or a heterogeneous group of, of government. I think the key life event, I think it, this is a really important concept that better understands on, on the, the services that local and regional governments are providing. On the other hand, also the life of their citizens, uh, citizens that are uh, going uh, through some key stages, key events throughout their lives. They're giving birth to children. Uh, these children have to go to school, they go to higher education, they have to have look for a job, they marry, etc. they retire. I think here it's important to be aware that many of these key life events, uh, you really need to interact with government and especially in several of them or quite many of them, you need to interact with your local government. It already shows that local governments, uh, they are often the primary contact point for supporting, interacting with you uh, at each of these uh, uh, stages or at each of these events. On the other hand, for many of these events, uh, for instance, if you want to, uh, the example of moving home or building a house, you probably need to uh, interact or you need some kind of input, feedback, approval, permission from many different governments. So that's the idea of seamless services that the, the, the citizen do not have to interact with each uh, level separately. But uh, I think there's the important, how can we uh, use the local level as the, uh, as the primary uh, point of contact? How can they be used to better interact with citizens at these the key stages? Now, the example on the right, I think that's important uh, from the perspective of interoperability efforts. Uh, is that the idea on, on creating catalogs of these different services, creating catalogs also of live events to really on one hand show or organize your services around these uh, live events, but also look at how can you, uh, how can we address interoperability challenges uh, with regard to these uh, joint. Uh, this focus is more on the issue of uh, digital services provision, which is really uh, uh, subnational governments. You see that they are coming more and more, uh, making the transition towards digital governments. So more and more, they provide uh, online or even digital uh, services. They do it for their own efficiency. They do it to improve the experiences of their citizens. Uh, and that they especially do it, uh, or they uh, do a lot of effort in making uh, information that is relevant to their citizens available online. So the work, the, the work of, for instance, ESPON that really shows the evolution on, on uh, putting more or creating, establishing more uh, digital services at subnational level. Uh, but they're also aware that still some key challenges, uh, they remain relevant. So it's the governance challenge skills that's really coming back quite a lot. How can we make sure that not only our public servants, our decision makers have the right skills, but also our citizens themselves, they need to uh, have the skills to interact digitally with their uh, subnational government. And then beside the technological part of the story, you have a very uh, lot of uh, legislative and uh, policy issues. I think now it's time for another poll, just to uh, engage, activate you, and collect your view on, on some of the topics uh, we addressed before. Yes, thank you, Glenn. So after you being introduced to some uh, basic concepts and definitions and uh, role of uh, uh, different um, uh, subnational governments, uh, we have another question for you. So EO policies and related initiatives on digital government and our data strategies should better recognize subnational governments and their potential contribution to these policies. So would you, what would you be your level of agreement on that uh, statement? Maybe five another seconds. Uh, so reviewing the results, uh, so it's obvious that you agree or either strongly agree with this statement. So it's I think it's a good uh, uh, feedback for continuing. Uh, so Glenn, I would uh, ask you to continue with the location intelligence for smarter local and regional public services. 
So this section is rather an introduction on what is location intelligence and why it's relevant. And in the fourth one, my colleague Therese will show some examples on how this can be realized or what are the key challenges. Uh, like I said before, I talked a lot about services, digital services in the link with key live events. Just to show you here a set of examples that show that many of the live events uh, I've introduced before, uh, live events relevant to uh, the work of subnational governments, they can or they should in fact ideally be supported by location data, by location technologies, building a house, starting changing schools, reporting crime, starting up a business. Just a few examples of real, uh, uh, real applications that showing that maps uh, and also uh, digital uh, geospatial data and uh, technologies uh, are relevant for delivering uh, these services. I think this figure uh, is a good summary of, of what we are uh, discussing today. Uh, it shows, in fact, the evolution you're all aware of from uh, general ICT, web presence, online services, e-government, and then the concept we are looking at now, the transformation towards more digital governments. Uh, this figure uh, is uh, from the context of Elise itself. It also shows what is now the uh, scope, the focus of uh, e Elise, but also previous initiative, the EULF Arena. EULF Arena that's rather focusing more on the transition from online services towards more e-government services, while Elisa is really looking at the transformation towards digital government and really looking at how location intelligence can support this. Just a definition, I think this is the OECD definition of digital government, so it's about digital technologies, but really as, how can, as part of how can we transform, modernize our uh, public service delivery, how can we uh, rely for doing this on an ecosystem of not only the government, but also how can we involve non-government actors, how can we take advantage of, of their knowledge, but also their uh, data. I think here from this perspective is location intelligence about uh, enabling these new ways of delivering uh, public value, but also these new ways of providing services uh, and uh, rechanging our government processes. Uh, this rather looks at the future, or not only the future, it's already the present, because it sees a key initiative on, on the data policy at the European level or the data strategy. So the recent European data, data strategy uh, in which the ambition was formulated that the EU should become or will become if they uh, should become a leading role model for a data-driven society, data-driven not only looking at the public sector, but also looking at how can citizens, how can businesses be involved in this society, how can they uh, jointly cooperate. Uh, the data strategy proposes a set of key elements, including a policy framework, the idea of business support and integration. I think the new concept of data spaces uh, also uh, very relevant and then the idea on working towards opening a set of uh, high value data sets and really uh, not on how it was done in the past, more a producer driven, no, really focusing on how can we make sure that we meet the demands, that we meet the needs of many different users, of potential users. I think important with regard to this strategy, which now I think is the key element with, uh, in the EU uh, view work on everything with regard to data, also geospatial data, geospatial data infrastructure, the European uh, infrastructure for spatial information inspire, I think it well fits into this uh, entire picture, into this story. I think many of these uh, elements that the European data strategy put forward as things to be uh, put in place, I think inspire, so the European uh, spatial data infrastructure, but also many related initiatives at national level, I think they already uh, support uh, or they provide or they can deliver many of these uh, elements uh, requested. Finally, another slide on how, just to make sure that you better understand how we perceive location intelligence. Now, I was surprised that many of you already had some good or some really expert knowledge on what is meant with this concept, uh, because even in the preparation of this presentation, we had a lot of discussion on how should we understand it? What is the best, best way to explain it? And I think the best way that we, in the end, used was the broader view on the real processes uh, that allow to turn uh, geospatial inputs, uh, traditional geospatial data, but also more innovative sources, more innovative ways of collecting data. So the processes in the sense of combining many different types of technologies, 
traditional GIS, but also new emerging technologies like uh, AI, digital twins, augmented reality, big data, etc. These kind of technologies become more important, but also the link with new ways of collaboration, new ways of co-design, governments, new forms of legislation. So turning these geospatial uh, resources into outputs, outputs in the sense of uh, new innovative geospatially aware decisions and geospatial enabled services. So I think both the process of turning these inputs into outputs uh, is about location intelligence. Uh, it's about transforming uh, also this process itself. It's about new ways of organizing uh, this process. Uh, just some uh, ideas on how we uh, operationalize this concept. But in the next session, we will give you some examples on, on how we see uh, this process, this issue of or this concept of location intelligence in reality. Time for another poll. Simon, do you want to introduce the slide? The question or should we just vote? sorry sorry i was muted once again so now being introduced to the location intelligence uh, concept as well it's a question for you how would you assess the current level of use of location intelligence or smartness uh, in subnational governments in europe so please uh, take uh, 10 or 15 seconds for answering Thank you for your answer. So based on your answer, it looks like that is uh, rather moderate or even lower. So the, the current level of use of the location intelligence. Uh, so maybe next uh, section, uh, Therese will maybe introduce us a bit uh, more the cases. So we'll see the, the different cases of uh, uh, enabling uh, location intelligence and smartness. Thank you, Simon. Yes. Um, I will first very briefly introduce myself. My background is more in spatial planning. So what I did when looking for cases was try to find good examples of proactive and relational approaches to the smart development. The first question we have to ask is how can we evolve into a future in which we are more than just a collection of smart islands, smart house, smart neighborhood, smart city, smart region, with all different smart projects. The key is to have a holistic view and have a right underlying technical structure. This statement comes from the uh, Stefan Lefever. He's the technical director of City of Things at IMEC, and the way he explains it is by comparing to what happened with the introduction of electricity at the beginning of last century. So power networks were put in place, but to connect the machinery, the appliances to the network, you needed power sockets, you needed outlets. And basically from a technical point of view, the same thing is happening with the datafication. We produce a lot of data, but we need data outlets to connect the different applications. And these applications then provide the city with intelligent solutions. Now, similar to the electrification, electrification required standards. What voltage, what frequency, what shape for the power sockets. And the same happens with datafication. If we, for example, collect data, about with sensors, we measure air quality, we measure uh, smart part, uh, small particles. We need to understand these numbers. And in order to understand these numbers, they have to have a good label attached to it. Those labels must be universal. They cannot cause any confusion, even in different languages and cultures. So the interoperability of the semantics of data is crucial from a technical point of view. Now, the mechanisms for releasing these data also have to be universal, not just in one city, but also 
in multiple cities, it has to be upscalable, it has to be in entire regions. So that's the main technical challenge. But it's not the only one. The organizational, the legal challenges are e equally important. And when we talk about smart cities, smart regions specifically, there is another challenge that is extremely important is the communication with the citizens, the relation with the citizens. A smart city that takes into consideration from the outset what the citizens, what the stakeholders need, it has to be included in the smart actions. That's the only way to contribute or to have more chance for success. We can look at these challenges from a different point of view. We have basically three key components. The physical infrastructure, the quality of life, and the innovation ecosystems. The physical infrastructure includes what is present in the physical place as well as in the digital twin with location intelligence linking both, tying the physical and the digital together. The ecosystem deals with the collaboration between the stakeholders, the whole quadruple helix, where location intelligence is needed to allow the interoperability among different platforms that are used in these different uh, uh, families of stakeholders. Ultimately, the solutions need to improve the quality of life of the citizens and the competitiveness of places. To come back to the example of electrification, the power lines, once they were installed, once the people got access to it, it changed the lifestyle dramatically. And this lifestyle ended up changing the characteristics of the city itself. When we see what happened at the beginning of last century, we had a social reform, which is reflected physically in changing cities, the City Beautiful movement in Chicago, the Garden City in England. So the, the end result is that the innovation changes the lifestyle and ch the changes of lifestyle are reflected in a change of the, the smart city, the smart region. I will now present the three cases where location intelligence is a key element of the solution. The first case is about physical infrastructure and st standardization. There I took the example of the object type library from the uh, Flanders Public Works Department. The second case is setting up a collaboration ecosystem. And there I, I chose the Pinus Twins platform for cross-border collaboration between Helsinki and Estonia. And for the third one, I took a smart energy solution in France where we have wind farm uh, that is citizen owned. So that has a dramatic impact on the quality of life and competitiveness of a rural area. The first example, the standardization of road infrastructure data started from a problem that they have in the public works department that the objects that are linked to road infrastructure through their life cycle go through different systems. In the planning, it's usually building information management system. During the construction, it's GIS. Later, it's facility management information systems. And what they wanted was to develop a solution so that once an object is created or even at the design phase, that it has a digital twin that will follow the object throughout its life cycle, even if it moves from one place to the other. The, why couldn't they use an existing system for that? Because typically the 3D linear objects they are dealing with, 
are very different from the ones that are used uh, typically for uh, networks. It's 2D and for objects like in BIM, there it's in 3D. So they decided to make an object type library for each object related to road infrastructure. And it started at the public works department. They, when they implemented it, they started to use it for the, the planning phase. And then they, so they included it in the tendering, which means that it was included in the design, in the construction, in the maintenance, the retrofitting, renovation, demolition work. So all the different stakeholders involved are using the same object. Once that started to be implemented, there was a snowball effect. So we see now that not only the public works department is using it, but also the public transport company, the waterway company, uh, agency for maritime and coastal services. There is an urban mobility lab in Antwerp that uses it. Um, there is an organization that coordinates construction works. So what is the key here for the transformation process and how important is the location infrastructure? When we take the same uh, overview of input process and outputs, we see that the starting point was that where originally we had these islands in the different uh, life cycle moments of the infrastructure, that these are now communicating through the standardized object type libraries. Once the process, once the technical solution was resolved to, to have the standardization, so the standards were developed, and that was a big initial cost, that was a big challenge. It was implemented in one department, but this started to stimulate data sharing and after a while other infrastructures became involved and then after that bus companies others started to make use so we have a tre tremendous snowball effect once the standardization is operationalized and in the end it results in cost savings it results in smart and flexible infrastructure but it also has the advantage that through the digital approach it makes the infrastructure more ready for new forms of mobility for autonomous vehicles for the communication between these vehicles and the infrastructure this is now the its future but the fact that the infrastructure has been standardized in its digital uh, counterpart, in its digital twin, facilitates and, and makes the region better prepared for this type of innovation. Where is the role of location intelligence? Well, of course, linking the infrastructure correctly with the digital twin. One of the typical examples of problems that we had was there is some mobile infrastructure when there are construction works or and this is now correctly linked. If, some, if an object has been moved, it, has, it is moved in the physical and it is also moved in the digital uh, twin. It facilitates the shared use of data and it allows the a complete life cycle of the infrastructure to be location enabled. So even when you move an object from one place to another. And what we also see, and that is very important to acknowledge, is that once the system is in place, it stimulates innovation through these living labs, which are really needed in urban and regional environments, because the innovations that are tested in synthetic situations in laboratory conditions, before they can be rolled out in the real environment, they have to be tested out. And that's what we see also with Lantis using 
the OTL in their, um, in their living lab. The second example is the one of setting up a cross-border collaborative ecosystem across border between uh, Helsinki and the region of Estonia. What happened here was the, the concept was to develop an urban operating system that allows to capture real-time data from a lot of different uh, sensors or applications in the city, in the region, and connect them to an urban information system. This is where the location is, the location information is critical because that's the, all these sensors and all these events that are uh, measured in the real world are connected through to the same urban innovation system. Then the, the data are in an open data platform so that they can be accessed by different businesses, citizens, governments, and they can access directly, real time, the data. The platform allows then development of new processes. The three teams where they were, um, at, that were pri uh, first priority was mobility, energy, and the built environment. So what is interesting here is the scalability and the flexibility of the solution. Um, and when we think about the transformation process and the importance of location intelligence, here it's a matter of upscaling. And the main problem that we find when upscaling local solutions is that there is, in general, there are two approaches. Either a local solution, a smart city, starts building up from scratch, from the ground up, or they will uh, extend existing solutions and grow incrementally. Now, when you want to upscale or when you want to share cross-border with other cities and, or other regions, the first solution is very expensive because you have different systems that are not communicating and that cannot be adapted since they have uh, been developed specifically for their environment. And the second solution tends to be very slow. So the process of bringing all the data together and it started by bringing together the stakeholders and then developing this urban operating system and bringing all the data together and make them available for all that is what ultimately led to support of cooperation or offered new possibilities for cooperation and we see that this allowed to evolve from the island, smart city island, towards a smart region. It allowed to go over the, to uh, uh, develop jointly cross-border services. And it also, and that's similar to what we saw in the first case, it's also an interesting case for stimulating innovation because you have this living lab, this integrated living lab. Where is location intelligence key in this solution? Well, you need location intelligence to connect the data, the sensor data. We need location intelligent, intelligence to integrate data streams from various sources. Location intelligence is also the key for the joint production of cross-border services. It is, of course, what is needed for the scalability and it provides a test bed for new innovations and it is also part of the flexibility because the system works well because it can evolve close to the market close to the citizen close to the government so it's both in the geographic and in the uh, stakeholder it's 
a, a point of view, it's close to, uh, to the needs. Then the third case is one in France. It's um, the development of, it's called a, a wind farm. It's a Isaac Watts, it's a wind, citizen owned wind farm. It was created in France, uh, 15 kilometers south of uh, Redon, near the Morbihan, the Loire Atlantique. It's a citizen-owned wind farm that was possible because there is subsidy for the development of this type of, of citizen projects, um, which is organized through um, France ENR. At this point, it involves, it's a small scale project. Eh? It, it involves four wind turbines, 600 citizens. The, the investment was very large, 11 and a half million euros. And the project was calculated for 10 years and it has been uh, working since the, the beginning. So after the investment, the, it has been completely operated and organized by citizens. So the board of directors, all volunteers. The geospatial dimension is very important here because as you see the map on the uh, top right, when different requests are made to invest in local energy production, we need to know where the potential is best. So it's important to identify where to invest for the local energy production. It is also important to have projects that are embedded in both social, cultural environment. It helps what you see on the left side, on the bottom left side. You, uh, the citizens, well, everybody can check real time there is a monitoring real time of the production. So it allows people to, to quantify their economic benefits. And it's set up as a co-actor, co-responsible structure based on the, the needs of, of the people. And then the next slide, please. So when we look at what process was needed here at the beginning, we had a distributed energy production, which, and that's the same everywhere, is very disruptive for the traditional centralized energy production and distribution business models. In order to make these local energy projects possible, there had to be support for the initial investment because these local communities, especially a lot of these projects are in rural areas, in remote areas, not densely populated. So there has to be support for the initial investment and there has to be support, not so much financial, but more from a governance point of view for the management and regional uh, operations. The key is to develop a business model that reappropriates the energy to the citizens. So they are, the citizens are involved in the energy transition and the energy transition is linked to a social societal transition. So as I said before, why is, is it important to have location intelligence here? It's important in the investment phase. It's important because it has to be locally embedded. It's important to quantify the economic benefits and it has to be based on where people live. If we want to have a co-actor, co-responsible structure, we need to acknowledge the specificities of the location. So this is the third example. I leave the floor back to Glenn. 
Thank you very much, Teres, for these uh, nice examples. Uh, also, a very diverse examples showing uh, what we uh, consider as location intelligence in the context of smart cities. Now we are a little bit behind schedule, mainly because I, I did a little bit of too much talking in the beginning. I just want to summarize the key message of today and also look at the future in, in a few slides. And afterwards, as, as quick as possible, we'll have some discussion. Uh, also, have, uh, give the participants the opportunity to provide their feedback. Uh, this slide, so I think this tries in, a, in an attempt to try to summarize what we consider as the move from traditional government towards smart government, which is set, set a shift with regard to the data, technology and the processes. I think the output side I didn't include, we didn't include in this picture, but in fact it leads to new uh, products, new services, new ways of decision making. Now, from the ELISA perspective, I think two uh, elements should be uh, considered here. So if you look at the data, technology, processes all together, that's about the process of increasing the intelligence or integrating uh, location intelligence within government. That's a key issue, but also an issue that we uh, sometimes address, but maybe not enough today. It's about interoperability. How can we make sure that different solutions, different data that we uh, develop, implement, are really interoperable. I think that's a key issue that we always need to take into account. Uh, then also uh, some thoughts on how can we make that shift. I think it's partly a responsibility of the subnational governments themselves. They have to better understand their services. They really need to think well a strategic approach, just not start about it, but really uh, develop a clear strategy, appoint a leader and make sure that uh, the entire organization involved but also the budget is being available. Testing, experimenting is very important. The skill issue uh, we talked about before. And then the collaboration, I think that's a key element. Uh, these are maybe quite general. But I think what we did here are just some general recommendations on smart government, digital government. I think the key challenge from Elise is how can we develop actions that really support or that really uh, contribute to each of these actions, each of these next developments. And then the final slide is not only, uh, we don't consider it solely as a responsibility of the cities, municipalities, region themselves, but I think also the national and the EU level should think on how can they support these subnational governments. Uh, some of them, or in some cases, they are already doing that. They're working on this interoperability, creating partnerships, providing different types of instruments, in also including the financial instruments that really support. Uh, but I think this is really uh, something that we should think about, think well on what is now the most appropriate kind of uh, instrument actions, also the legal framework that both the national governments, but also the European Commission could do to really support the local and regional governments in, in that uh, transition toward more smart places. Uh, with these final words, I would like to conclude the presentation. I think we have one more polling question. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, attention. Also, uh, our apologies that it took a little bit more time than we expected. But just let's just go to the uh, final poll. And then maybe afterwards we can, uh, those of you that would like to uh, say a few words, we can have a short session uh, also to see, uh, collect new ideas on, on how Elisa could uh, build further or could look further into this topic, I think is really relevant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Glenn and Therese, uh, to sharing with us these interesting insights uh, on the topic. Uh, so before we proceed to the questions and answer and comments, uh, I would like to pose uh, another question here, now having all this in mind, what you heard today. Uh, so first question, uh, in your opinion, who should take the lead in making the shift from traditional to smart uh, national, subnational governments? Is it the commission or the national governments? Is it subnational governments or is it the cooperational process of all? And on the other side, uh, we would like to ask you, so how do you see Elise contributing to turning local and regional governments into smart places? So please uh, have another 20 seconds maybe to answer these polls. And then we'll proceed to uh, answers and questions and for the comments. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your answers. Uh, 
So it's obvious that mainly you see this as a cooperation process of all. Uh, and on the other side, uh, uh, you would like to see to have an exchange of best practices and training and capacity building offered through the ELISA in the future. Uh, okay, so uh, according to your first uh, answer, so uh, cooperation process, so maybe before uh, looking at the uh, question and the answers, uh, I would maybe invite uh, representatives of different levels here today. Uh, I think we have some representatives from the European Commission, some national representatives, and I hope we have also some regional local representatives. Uh, so looking maybe at this point, uh, asking maybe uh, Andrea Halmos from DigiConnect uh, to give some overall general comments on what has been said today and or what has been commented, or also maybe of some polls. So please, Thank Andrea. You. Thank you very much and um, happy to have been able to follow this a very interesting uh, discussion and, uh, and the presentations as well. So uh, I work in the Smart Cities Unit at DG Connect, so it's extremely relevant for our work. And I was uh, pleased to see uh, the examples on how location uh, information can, of course, help the work of, of local and, and regional administrations and, and also the way how you have recognized what's already being done. So perhaps just to reiterate and some of the questions were related to this as well, I would like to mention uh, three aspects on, on where our um, efforts are now focused in terms of helping cities, but of course in this context also communities and other types of places to become smarter. Uh, we have, um, as, as, as you also mentioned, it's difficult to scale up solutions. And one of our studies have shown, uh, and many of the projects have indicated that if there were um, interoperable urban platforms that could manage the large amounts of data, it would be easier to, uh, to manage the different sectoral data sets and the different stakeholders using that data. And it also helps uh, to ensure data uh, sovereignty and, and the respect of, of private data, because sometimes it refers to also data that has a privacy element. So in that context, we're focusing a lot on helping cities to implement interoperable urban platforms. These are uh, following open standards and a set of basic so-called minimal interoperability mechanisms. Um, and if you're interested to know more about either the technicalities or the concrete uh, uh, implementation efforts. You're welcome to check out this Living in EU uh, movement. It was also on one of the slides of KU Leuven explaining that there is a declaration which can be signed by, by cities to commit themselves, cities and regions, uh, and even national level governments to commit themselves to implement these platforms and also to uh, set a number of principles by which these should be used. And um, there's a number of commitments therein. And one of the commitments actually relates to even monitoring uh, the impact of, of digital at local level, which was one of the questions, I think, of Giacomo. Um, so one area is platforms. Uh, the other area is certainly data. And many of you, of course, have have been discussing the use of data for innovation. And we've also seen a lot of cities, of course, opening up their data or sharing data within their administrations, but also more and more the need for actually sharing data and using having access to privately held data. So this is what's behind the so-called data strategies, uh, what was also mentioned, common European data spaces. And as mentioned, one of our objectives is that, as you know, there will be a, a common European data space for the Green Deal. So actually having access and sharing data among a set of stakeholders uh, for uh, objectives of the Green Deal. And in preparation for that, we're trying to develop uh, a data ecosystem for for smart cities, uh, agreeing on what this data governance could be, agreeing on, on you know, how to uh, better access data uh, and, and reuse it, even if it's essentially held by, by private sector entities for specific purposes of, of public value or purposes of, of making city life better. Um, and finally, we're focusing on applications using data, in particular with the use of artificial intelligence. And we're hoping to help cities develop their own digital twins. We heard some examples today, but uh, there's quite a number of uh, cities already experimenting with this in Europe and we'd like to help create 
a set of um, enablers to create and, and increase the capacity of other cities to follow suit. And all this, what we're trying to do is going to be supported by the forthcoming Digital Europe program. So please um, follow. I will put in the comment box the newsletter that you can sign up to on Smart Cities, where you'll be informed about the upcoming info day, for example, about the Digital Europe program for Smart Cities, as well as a new session that we'll do during the European Week of Regions and Cities on Urban Digital Twins. So hope to see many of you around these webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your, for your comments and views. So from the point of the uh, Commission, DigiConnect, as well mentioning the Digital Twins. So also in the next uh, session, so the next part of our story, we'll touch uh, with some cases uh, to the Digital Twins, uh, Helsinki and uh, uh, Guimaraes. Uh, maybe we can proceed uh, with some national view. I you can see just a few representatives of national governments here. Uh, Marcus Jobs, maybe. Can I invite you for commenting a few things today? Yes, you can. Welcome. Hello. Good Thank afternoon. You. Um, Thank you for this uh, webinar, also for this session. And um, there are several topics that are really, really important, um, especially for the session of the local legislation and the federation systems. And um, what we experience now in the INSPIRE implementation is that the models that we are following, the data specifications are nice, but they're really a consensus um, schema and they are not um, sufficient to fulfill all those local laws. And therefore, um, what we have done is to, to put some effort in the, in the implementation of the, of the local registries, like the Registry Federation. And we support, of course, that the GSC did it and also the European program did it. But we know that um, without these extension, extensions of the data specifications, we have no chance to get the data somehow interoperable. We will have them findable, we will have them accessible, but they are not interoperable and reusable. And these are the key topics if we go into smart cities or smart regions. And um, therefore we need some kind of, how to say, it's not flattening, it's making a loose coupling of those data schemas, which is at the moment some questions for us if this is an additional layer in between, a, a, a data bus, which allows us to connect to different local um, data schemas and to embed them in an overall inspire schema or whatever. So these are, these are um, it's an effort or a focus that we are following here in Austria um, for the data providers. We're following up the, the inspire um, harmonization, of course. But on the other hand, we observe that this um, harmonization is so rough, so strong, that um, we need, especially for the local governments and the local legislation, that we need um, possibilities to embed um, existing um, data schemas and data themes or topics and structures in order to be really smart and to create a digital twin. And this is preventing us from creating a digital twin at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus, for this view from the national point of view. Mentioning already the data interoperability, so Elisa, as such as a part of the ISA Square program, is tackling different levels of, of interoperability actually uh, defined in the European interoperability framework. So, uh, legal, organizational, semantic, and technical layers, which are uh, of course, all very much important for uh, for the uh, when uh, uh, connecting smart cities and to uh, in, the, in the transition for the to the smart places. Uh, do we have some uh, local or regional representative here, please? I I would invite maybe for the local or regional point of view. So please, you are kindly welcome to give some comments. Are there any? I don't see any hands. So since we are a bit uh, late, uh, I would suggest maybe to just double check the question. I think most of the questions have been already answered. Uh, here, this was a question from 
from uh, Giacomo, it was answered by Andrea. Uh, Ramiro Bueno Martinez uh, uh, as well answered. I hope you were happy uh, with, the, with the answers. Uh, I don't know, maybe Ramiro Bueno, as I recall, you are from the NGO. Is there any NGO perspective on this topic? So maybe in the half a minute, one minute comment. No? Okay. So then we'll continue to the last question, last final question. Uh, I think that was uh, uh, the question about the open source uh, software by uh, Germain Barba. What limits do you find in using open source software and how do you try to overcome them? Isn't it easier sometimes to go for a proprietary software solution? Uh, maybe I will invite here uh, our colleague from GRC, Marco Minghini, to give some views and comments on that. Um, hello everyone. Yeah, just uh, as, as I commented in the chat, this could be a, a, a big discussion. Um, I, I couldn't say, I think no, no one could say we should go on open source, we should go on proprietary software. It really depends on many um, bounding conditions and many, many, many elements uh, and the specific problem or functionality that we need. Uh, it depends on the budget, it depends on the specific type of available open source. Um, software. Um, so, I mean, in, in general, it's it's not possible to give a, um, um, a reply to this question, uh, for sure. Uh, although um, I'm, uh, uh, in general, a fan of open source software solutions, I'm not saying that open source uh, is solving all the problems. And sometimes uh, uh, proprietary solutions are, are um, are good um, again. What I think was pointed out in the chat is that uh, open source software uh, hides a lot of development costs and problems with functionality. What uh, should be clear is that uh, really open source software doesn't mean that the software is for free. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't have to pay. You usually do not pay for using the software, but you pay um, uh, other things. For example, you pay your staff to be trained or you pay for additional functionality and so on and so forth. So that is always to keep uh, uh, in mind when um, uh, moving uh, or considering open source uh, solutions. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for uh, sharing uh, your views on, on that. Uh, I think with that, uh, uh, we were coming to the end of this webinar. Uh, so please, uh, uh, thank you very much once again for all the participants and for to Glenn and uh, uh, Therese uh, to, for uh, very nice uh, presentations. Also, thank you for, uh, for your comments. Uh, so as you can see on the next slide, you can follow us uh, uh, on uh, several different channels. Uh, so on the uh, join up on the Lisa page, on the Twitter new location and on the special playlist. So at this uh, occasion, I would like to once again invite you to the next uh, uh, part of our story on location intelligence for cities and regions on 17th of October, where we will uh, deal with the, uh, more in the technology trends and case studies in digital government. Uh, so thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye.